pass on for you today. Well, I'll try to be really loud. How about that? Welcome. Welcome to Riverside Baptist Church. We hope that you have a uh, wonderful time here worshiping the Lord with us today. That's why we've gathered. We're glad to see you here. Uh, we got some folks we haven't seen in a while, and a family come to visit each other, and uh, we're glad that y'all are here, and we're glad that all of our normal, regular attendees are here, and uh, we'll see at the end of summer, so some of our folks are coming back, and that's uh, good for us, but uh, I know the kids are not happy that the school's starting back up. That's like, I'm going back to my prison starting next Monday. <laughs> I, I, I mix it. Fix it. Right now. Oh, the amplifier wasn't on. Uh, that would make a difference. Thank you, Ellie. You're welcome. All right. In terms of announcements, things coming up, several uh, big things we want to make sure you remember about. Uh, of course, this Wednesday night at 6.30 is prayer meeting. So please come out for that to pray for uh, each other, for our church, for uh, the church around the world, and for our world in general. This coming Saturday at 5 o'clock is the church picnic. 5 o'clock this Saturday, one week from yesterday, is the church picnic. Uh, we have almost 30 people signed up, if I remember. Uh, that's my last count. Some more might have signed up this morning. And so uh, we're glad. But remember, you can also invite friends. Just make sure you let someone on that committee. That's William and Marguerite and who else, William? Lillian, William and Lillian and Marguerite on that committee for the picnic. So if you have guests that are coming, just let them know the next day or two. Uh, and uh, if you are willing, please bring a side or a dessert. They're providing the uh, hamburgers and hot dogs out of the, the church budget, of course. So that will be Friday, I'm sorry, Saturday at 5 o'clock. We also are doing a, a fundraiser. We didn't have our regular pork chop fundraiser last year because of all the COVID craziness. Uh, this year, the Baptist men are getting Captain Bob to uh, cater the fundraiser with a plate that's a combination of fried chicken and barbecue, potatoes and green beans. Uh, dessert not included, it's gonna be $10. Bert has the tickets, so please get some tickets from Bert and uh, invite people, sell the tickets, and uh, that will be the fundraiser for Baptist Man and the Circle of Friends. Circle is going to be providing desserts at a separate uh, cost. They're doing a dessert sale, so as people drive up, you know, they get the plate they already bought, hopefully they'll come up and buy one, and then we want some dessert to go with that too, don't you? And here's some of the wonderful things they've made. And so uh, that will be our fundraiser. And remember, these two groups do most of the actual community ministering and um, charitable giving and things like that that we do as a church. So this is how they have the funds to do that. We need everybody's help to sell tickets. And if you're available to, on that Thursday, September 16th, uh, we are offering lunch and supper. So not expecting most people to stay all day, but we need some drivers at lunchtime, some drivers at supper time to help deliver uh, the big groups. So if uh, an employer or uh, a business and a whole bunch of people working there buy lunches, we take them to them and things like that. So we do need some folks running the table, collecting money for drive ups. We do need some folks willing to uh, make deliveries on that day for lunch and supper time as well. So please uh, let uh, Linda or let Rick or one of us Baptist men know they are willing to help, and we will start coordinating those volunteers uh, when we have tickets to know where they're all going. All right. Any other oh, uh, phase about to do the new uh, church directory that comes out every September when we start a new church year. So if you have a change of address, phone number, anything like that, make sure you let Faye know so she can put it in the directory. Any other announcements? Anything needs to come before the group? Oh, uh, no, I do. I don't write down, I forget it. Uh, next Sunday, also at 6 o'clock, we'll be showing the second episode of The Chosen. Uh, we had a nice turnout, about a dozen last week when we saw the first episode of this uh, new TV series based on the life of, of Jesus and the people he called to follow him, his chosen followers. 
And uh, we're showing the second episode this coming week, so please join us Sunday night, 6 o'clock in the Fellowship Hall. Uh, we'll have uh, some popcorn and drinks and uh, other goodies maybe, and uh, have a good time together. Invite folks. This is a, a great, one of the good shows, well done. But it's also a very non-threatening, easy to respond way of inviting people to come and then have a discussion about Jesus and his followers and things, uh, stories from the Bible that the show picks up on, stories they tell that aren't in the Bible based on uh, their interpretation of characters and their uh, development of backstories of characters that we don't know. Like, what was Nicodemus like? We have no idea. We know he meant to talk to Jesus in John 3. And we know at the end of his life, he argued to have him get buried properly. But they give him a character. They give him a backstory. They give him this desire to find out more than what he's been teaching all of his life. Something else has to be out there. And it's um, it's interesting and it's a good conversation starter about the narratives of the Bible and the people in the Bible. So invite folks, come and see, and uh, it's, it's, we have a good time together. Also next Sunday, as part of his uh, studies at NC. Yeah, Mid-Atlantic Christian University, Matthew. Uh, Gene will be here preaching. I'll be here to do all the normal, you know, my Sunday school class and welcome announcements and stuff like that. But Gene will be preaching the service. Uh, I'm going to be evaluating him formally, and I think he's asked a couple of you also to give some feedback and evaluations. Uh, this is for uh, kind of a mentorship, internship thing he's doing this summer in the class. So Gene will be here to bring the message next Sunday. And the last Sunday of the month, the 29th, uh, Amanda and I, the boys and I will be gone on vacation and he'll be filling in the pulpit uh, again. It will not be here that Sunday. It's uh, my last vacation week before the uh, church year ends. So, you know, it's use it or lose it, so I'm going to go ahead and use it. Thank you guys for giving it to me. I want to take advantage of it. Now, anything else? Okay, let's open up with a word of prayer. Holy Father God, we do thank you for this time you have given us to assemble ourselves together. I thank you, Lord, for these that are here to join in worshiping and fellowshipping. Uh, we worship you, fellowship with each other. But we also get to fellowship with you, the God who made the universe, the Holy One, wants to be with us. And Lord, that is astounding, and that is wonderful, and it, it fills our hearts and it boggles our minds. But Lord, we just take you at your word that you want to be with us. You sought us, even though we were sinners. Even while we were still sinners, you paid the price for our sin, dying, which was our punishment, so we would be able to live forever with you. And so Lord, we thank you, we, we praise you, we follow you as our Lord, as we trust in you also as our Savior. I pray that you would bless the music this morning, uh, hide me behind your word and the cross so that what you are saying in your scripture comes out. Not words that I've put together, but your eternal word reaches into our hearts and our minds and brings us closer to you and works your perfect work in our lives. We also ask you to work through our lives. We lift up to you all of our brother and sister churches around the world. <clears throat> please Lord be with them and bless their worship bless their ministry we ask you Lord especially those who are leading and teaching in your name in countries where to do so is a risk to life and them I pray Lord that you would give them boldness and wisdom give them the, the zeal and the heart of a missionary and I pray Lord that you would sustain them Help us, Lord, if there's any way we can sustain that and do likewise here in our neighborhoods and in our towns. I ask you these things in the name of Jesus, so your will will be done here and throughout the world. Amen. The hymn of prayer this morning is the Solid Rock, hymn number 406. You would stand with me and sing all the verses of hymn 406.
Now we enter the time when we bring our petitions to the Lord for others. Uh, I do want to share a couple of updates. Uh, first, some praise reports. Uh, Mr. Ray Ashton had a good report from his doctor. The doctor says he's doing uh, well. His numbers are good. And also, I talked to Miss Mary Lou uh, earlier this week, and her doctor, and she are very pleased with how well she's doing. Our blood sugar's been uh, really good for a while, and uh, he's just thinking she's doing great, and she's very uh, thankful and praise filled to the Lord for how well she is doing. Uh, I was asked to share with you guys that uh, Dustin Perry, he was in a very bad car accident yesterday morning. Uh, broken femur, broken arms? Hip. Hip. Broken hip. Yeah, they went head balls. Both hips. Uh, scalp. Not the skull, but the scalp is almost scraped off in places, it seems like. Uh, very bad wreck yesterday morning, so please keep Dustin in your prayers. Uh, and Miss Marie had an unspoken that she did want me to share with you guys. Um, speaking about Dustin, mm -hmm. I think many here, if we let them know that he is Billy and Judy Perry's grandson, that will help them to relate to who he is, because I know there are others here that know Billy and Judy. Okay. Billy and Judy's grandson, Dustin. Todd and Christina are his parents. Um, my friend, she has a daughter, her name is Neela. Um, I shared her on Facebook, if anybody follows me on Facebook. She's on her second heart surgery. She's like nine months old. She's got COVID while she was in there. Which luckily her test has come back negative recently, so um, praising God for that. But just ask to be in prayer for her and Kelly and her parents who have gone through Nine months of just worry and, you know, everything parents yeah. experience. I can't pronounce her last name, though. I know Destiny's old last name, but the new last name is, I don't know, but Baby Mila. Baby Mila, God knows. Baby Mila. I shared in Sunday school this morning and took up quite a bit of time doing it. Because, all right, Lauren, Hill, Sproul fell this past week and broke her wrist in two places. Uh, she is going to re uh, require surgery, which will be done Wednesday in Norfolk General. It's her right hand, and she is right-handed. They're hoping that it will not be any permanency there after the surgery. Um, David Owens, which some of you probably know, is on a ventilator in the hospital in Greenville with COVID, or he was as of yesterday. Um, Ellen Harris, who is Doug Harris's wife, Doug was related to Peggy's first husband, Snag Harris. Ellen is going to have, well, she had surgery for cancer last October, has gone through chemo, and now is having some follow-up surgery this week. Her stepdaughter, Doug Harris's daughter, Leanne, within the past two weeks has lost her vision because of a mass on her pituitary gland. Um, thank you. What was Ellen's daughter saying? The one who lost her vision? Leanne Harris, well, she has, Leanne Harris is good enough. Do you know if they can do anything about that, get that mass off? The, the mass has been removed, and she went through that surgery all right, even though she's been on a transplant list for years for her heart. She's 55 years old. She will see a neurologist and an a specialist tomorrow to see if they think her vision may be restored. But in a period of two weeks time she went from being able to see to being blind. I 
Especially now as the COVID numbers go back up and each school and school district has to decide what we do, what safety measures, health measures we're putting in place, a lot of big decisions. both of them prayer. Yes. Right, let's set these up. Holy Father God, we come before you this morning. There are several praises that make our hearts happy good news and good reports from people we know and care about, but there are also accidents and sudden developments and sudden blindness. Babies who need surgery, Lord, and they make our hearts heavy. And Lord, in both the joy and the heaviness, we want to come before you and share, first of all, thanks that you answer so many prayers. Thanks that Mr. William Charles is already back out of the hospital. Thanks that uh, good doctor reports are happening. We pray, Holy God, that you would bless these others that we've mentioned who need your help. Lord, if it be your will, please bring healing. Uh, please restore the, the eyesight to Luann. Please remove the cancer out of the bodies of folks like Miss Ellen and, and others. Fight off the, the COVID resurgence that seems to be happening in the last several weeks, Lord, if it be your will. Weaken this Delta variance and keep us safe. We can only trust you to do that. We can be wise and take precautions, but you have everything in your hand. Lord, I, I pray that you would be with Mr. William Charles and others who need to go through therapy, go through rehab, go through reconstruction, like broken bones that need to be repaired, and help their bodies heal and mend. Help them, Lord, to be good patients and, and good at their therapy. We pray, Lord, for all of those, like Miss Betty, who take care of their loved ones while they're sick. Uh, please give them grace and peace patience and wisdom. We pray, Lord, especially for this little baby who has to go through heart surgery. Please be with her parents. Please be with her. Strengthen that tiny body. And as you have been doing since before she was ever born, keep holding her in your hand. We ask all these things because we, we care for these folks and we want them to feel better and to, to be happy but Lord, we know that you know always what's best and you know when each life has come to its end here on this world. And so we submit to your will and ask you, as Jesus told us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And Lord, we know that's not limited to right here to us, but we pray your will will be done in this whole world. Be with our nation. Be with the folks that we know and the folks we don't know who are lost and without you. Bring them to you, Lord. Give them conviction of sin and the need of a Savior. Help us as a church and help us as individuals to reach out to them, to share your gospel, to, to make the invitation, to be a loving presence in their life consistently. And I pray, Lord, that you would increase your kingdom Help us to teach them and train them how to be better disciples. And let us also be about growing to be better disciples. I pray, Lord, for our world leaders. You give them wisdom. Break them free from party politics and agendas to do your will and what's best for all the people. 
And I pray, Lord God, that you would guide and direct all of us towards you and towards your kingdom. That it may be here on earth as it is in heaven. We know what day it will be when you return. And we look forward to that day. But in the here and now, help us to be your good and faithful servants. I ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Special this morning is about that day when it is on earth as it is in heaven, and we will see the King soon and very soon. Isaac 
loved the food that Esau uh, prepared for him. Uh, Genesis 25, 28. Isaac loved Esau because he, Isaac, had a taste for wild game. Esau was a hunter. But Rebekah loved Jacob. And so from nearly the beginning, these two parents had, each one had their own favorite of the two sons, who were twins, but Esau was born earlier than Jacob. He was first. But Rebekah at least knew that Esau was destined to become the servant, the inferior brother, socially speaking, to Jacob. I assume, and I think it's safe to assume, she told Isaac what the Lord told her. And what we want to see today is that Isaac and to a lesser degree Rebekah uh, and also Jacob are so dominated by a sense of self-centeredness and self-focus that they work a great uh, destructive work against their own family and break it apart in several ways. Look at this idea of self-centeredness. And I really got the, the focus for reading this story this way, I, mean, I think it's there, but this jumped out at me. Uh, Vince, because of our, my conversation with Mary Lou earlier this week, we talked about her doctor's appointments and her good news, but we also just talked kind of about life. Uh, we talked about the post office for a while and the problems they give uh, Vince and Mary Lou. But just about life and our society in general. And she pointed out that in, in her life, she's seen a kind of deterioration of people's selflessness. She's talking about, you know, in the war efforts. When she was little and before, the stories she heard about people who had uh, coupons and had rationing and uh, coming out of the Depression, that she heard those stories that people took care of each other. People sacrificed for the good of the nation and militarily speaking, in some ways, the good of the world. Like, stopping Nazism was good for the world. and We had a part in that. Even folks here at home had a part in that because they sacrificed. They, they donated. They helped salvage the, the metals that the army could then reuse and what we call now recycle. And she said, and I agree with her, that people aren't like that anymore as a culture. There are individuals who are quite selfless, but as a culture, we have moved from this banding together, this good for the country, good for each other in our neighborhoods, to what's good for me? What do I want? What is my plan? What's my agenda? Our society is dominated by self-interested individualism. Our culture has shifted that way, but that's not a new facet of humanity. I think this story shows it, and many other stories in the Bible show it. But I think this increase is very obvious. Let's look at Genesis 27, starting with verse 1. I'm reading from the Holman Christian Standard Bible. When Isaac was old, and his eyes were so weak that he could not see, he called his older son Esau and said to him, My son. He answered, Here I am. And he said, Look, I am old and do not know the day of my death. So now take your hunting gear, your quiver and bow, and go out in the field to hunt some game for me. Then make me a delicious meal that I love and bring it to me to eat so that I can bless you before I die. Keep your place there. We'll continue almost the entire chapter. But Isaac here is not the the reflective, quiet young man he was that we see earlier in the story of Genesis. He wasn't the, the peaceful man we see in his interaction with Abimelech and the, his neighbors. In his old age, he became very, it seems from this story, very self-focused and self-serving. Look at this decision and what's told to us about Isaac and his son. He favors Esau. And now we all know parents shouldn't have a favorite. We should all love our children equally. Uh, we were, Ann and I were watching a show last night that had uh, one of the main characters was a daughter. Her mom came into her hospital. And uh, so her sister was there. We saw some family interaction. 
And she asked her mom, why were you always so much harder on me than on my sister? Do you, you love her more? And mom goes, no, I love you both equally. But I like her more. She's nicer to me and we have more things in common. Isaac might have said, well, I love my boys equally, but he definitely likes Esau more. But the only reason we get is that Isaac's a good hunter and he brings home some meat that I, uh, Esau's a good hunter and brings home some meat that Isaac likes to eat. That's not a great reason, is it? Hmm? Oh, I like to eat too. But it's not like the old man's going hungry and one kid is not feeding him. He's got thousands of servants. Right? Uh, it's, it's a sensual pleasure. And as we read this whole chapter, Isaac's always described by his senses in this final story. He can't see, but he loves this savory meat that Esau hunts. He, he tries to feel and smell to see which son is bringing the meal to him a little bit later, and he hears a distinctive difference in their voices. He's always described in this final story of his life sensually. I don't mean that like romantically or passionately, but just in terms of senses. He's being dominated by what his body tells him. He's making decisions, in this case, to go against what the Lord said and try to make Esau the dominant brother. Try to make Esau the one who's going to carry on the family name, get all the family inheritance, get the blessing of Abraham passed down to him when God has said, no, it's going to Jacob. Esau has pit his will and his wants, his choices against what God said is going to happen. And the only reason we get is Esau brings home some good taste and goat or deer or whatever around If he can make goat taste good, he is practically working a miracle, but it's all about what he can taste. So Isaac is quite centered here on his own body, his own flesh. Verse 5. Now Rebekah was listening to what Isaac said to his son Esau. So while Esau went to the field to hunt some game to bring in, Rebekah said to her son Jacob, listen, I heard your father talking with your brother Esau. He said, bring me game and make a delicious meal for me to eat so that I can bless you in the Lord's presence before I die. Now, my son, listen to me and do what I tell you. Go to the flock and bring me two choice young goats, and I will make them into a delicious meal for your father, the kind he loves. Then take it to your father to eat so that he may bless you before he dies. Jacob answered his mother, uh, Rebecca, his mother, look, my brother Esau is a hairy man. I'm a man with smooth skin. Suppose my father touches me. Then I'll be revealed to him as a deceiver and bring a curse rather than a blessing on myself. His mother said to him, your curse be on me, my son. Just obey me and go get them for me. So he went and got the goats and brought them to his mother. And his mother made the delicious food his father loved. Then Rebekah took the best clothes of her older son Esau, which were in the house, and had her younger son Jacob wear them. She put the skins of the young goats on his hands and the smooth part of his neck. Then she handed the delicious food and the bread she had made to her son Jacob. When he came to his father, he said, My father. And he answered, Here I am. Who are you, my son? Jacob replied to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Please sit up and eat some of my game so that you may bless me. But Isaac said to his son, How did you ever find it so quickly, my son? He replied, Because the Lord your God made it happen for me. Then Isaac said to Jacob, Please come closer so I can touch you, my son. Are you really my son Esau or not? So Jacob came closer to his father Isaac. When he touched him, he said, The voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. So he did not recognize them, because his hands were hairy, like those of his brother Esau. So he blessed him. Again he asked, Are you really my son Esau? And he replied, I am. 
Then he said, bring it closer to me, and let me eat some of my sons again, so that I may bless you. Jacob brought it closer to him, he ate, he brought him wine, and he drank. Then his father Isaac said to him, come closer and kiss me, my son. So he came closer and kissed him. When Isaac smelled his clothes, he blessed him and said, Ah, the smell of my son is like the smell of the field that the Lord has blessed. May God give to you from the dew of the sky and from the richness of the land an abundance of grain and new wine. May people serve you and nations bow and worship to you. Be master over your relatives. May your mother's sons bow and worship to you. Those who curse you will be cursed, and those who bless you will be blessed. This is the blessing he planned to give his favorite son, Esau. Notice the similarity, especially in the last line, with the those who bless you will be blessed, those who curse you will be cursed, of God's blessing on Abraham. He's intending to pass down the Abrahamic blessing and promise to Esau instead of to Jacob. He is deceived by his senses, even though he is suspicious because of some of them. And he lets himself be deceived and continue. When I have to imagine, it would be very easy to say, hey, Jeeves, outside, come in for a second. Who's that guy? Ah, it's Joseph. It's Jacob. And the whole thing would be wrong right there if he asked anybody to come into the house or the tent and confirm. He did. He's carried along by his senses, by his desire to bless Esau and to enjoy this Seems like he's thinking of a final meal with his son, but he does live for many years longer. Isaac is focused on his plans. Rebecca is focused likewise on her favorite son. Let me get what I think should happen. Now, what she thinks should happen does have at least a little bit of a defense. God told her Esau will serve Jacob. But I don't think Rebecca here is in any way a good example for us as a godly person. God never said to her, now Rebecca, I want Jacob to be the one to get the promise, but you've got to make sure it happens. God didn't say to her, Rebecca, your younger son's going to need your help when he gets older. He said to her, the older will serve the younger. Thus saith the Lord. He's going to make it happen. And so while Isaac has one sense of, uh, he has in one sense this self-centeredness of his plan, his physical desires, his hopes, Rebecca also has hers in the very same vein, but hers I think is more worry. Do you ever realize that worry and fear are also selfish? Self-centered at least. How am I going to take care of this horrible situation as might come? What am I going to do if he blesses Esau and sends Jacob? How, how is the Lord's will going to come about if I don't do my part? Now, we should work and follow the Lord. We should be his followers and his hands and feet. But it's like Mordecai told Esther in the book of Esther. She was hesitant because if she knew it, if she went before the king to try to save the Jewish people, her life could be forfeit. Mordecai said, God's going to save the people no matter whether you go or not. But if you don't go, he probably won't bless you anymore because you're going to be a coward and he's going to remove you and your family. I think Rebecca is very much like that young Esther in this case. She's worried. She's afraid. Not for her own life, but what's going to happen? What's going to happen to my favorite son? What's going to happen to, to my plans? What's going to happen to my family, how I see them working out? How can I take care of this? She doesn't have to take care of this. God told her he's going to do it. And so when I realized that there's these two sides, this Isaac-like, sensual, I want to focus on me and pleasing me, and it's Rebecca's side, almost like worry. And they're both focused on self. 
it, it's sort of making me realize that when I'm afraid, when I'm worried, when I think, oh, what am I going to do? How am I going to fix this? How am I going to help grow the church? How are we going to have enough money to do what we need to do? How am I going to raise my boys right? How am I going to fill in the blank? How am I going to react? How am I going to deal with it if something worse happens to my dad, happens to my mom? All these worries and fears we have as people that are a whole lot better when we realize it's not just me. They're a whole lot better when we realize it's not I have to deal with all of it on my own by myself. Rebecca didn't have to fix the problem. She just needed to wait for God to fix the problem. God used her and Jacob's deception, but I don't think sin is ever required for God's will to come about. Jacob, of course, aptly named the usurper, the grabber of the heel, the deceptive one. He's very obviously the most self-centered person in the story. He doesn't worry about, well, mom, I mean, we can't cover this up. My, my brother's going to be angry. Uh, this isn't right. I've already got his birthright. That dad bless him. He doesn't worry about any of that sort of thing. His only worry is, what if they catch me before I get the blessing? Very obviously, there's going to be a falling out. He's not going to be able to get away with it for long. He just has to get away with it long enough to get what he wants. And we know people like that. Right and wrong only matter while we're being watched. We don't get caught. So all three of them in different ways are very much focused on self. Their own plans, their own ideas, their own hopes, their own favorites, their feelings. Isaac lets his senses overwhelm his wisdom and what the Lord has told him to do. Isaac's led his plans and hopes for his favorite son. And I think probably the, the normal reaction of people around them plays a part of this. Everyone would assume the older son gets the inheritance, gets the promise, gets most of the, the wealth. But their emotions also keep them from God. Isaac loved Esau. Rebecca loved Jacob. And love is not wrong, right? It's the greatest commandment. Love God, love our neighbors. Loving people is one of the ways we are most like God, made in His image. We have the ability to love. But they're not loving in a godly, God-centered way. They're loving in this self-internally focused, and internally centered way. Because in anything we love that becomes more important than God, more important than his ways, more important than what he's told us to do, becomes an idol. That was Rick's devotional this morning in Baptist Men, kind of touched on this. Anything we love inordinately becomes too important and can take us out of God's will. So it's good, yes, love your children. But Isaac loved Esau to the point of violating God's word making plans contrary to what God told him would happen. That's an idol. That puts his will above God's, his plans and hopes above God's. The fear, the worry, the hope, even the love that we feel can make us into idolaters if we follow it more than we follow God. And that's what happened to this family. Except for Esau, who was the victim of all of this manipulation. Every one of them sought after their own way and their own will and did hurt to the others. Just to briefly summarize what happens in the rest of this chapter, Jacob gets the blessing right after Jacob leaves. Esau comes in with a meal for his father and he finds out that his father's already blessed his oldest son. His younger son. Excuse me. Look at verse 33. 
when Isaac realized he had not blessed Esau, but Jacob. It says, Isaac began to tremble uncontrollably. Who was it then, he said, who hunted game and brought it to me, and I ate it before you came in. And I blessed him, indeed, he will be blessed. When Esau heard his father's words, he cried out with a loud and bitter cry to his father, and said to his father, Bless me too, my father. But he replied, Your brother came deceitfully and took your blessing. Look at Isaac's reaction. A very physical, again, very visceral reaction of terror. The, the Hebrew word there, his shaking, is always connoted, connected excuse me, with fear, with terror. Everything has come unraveled for him. And he has this violent, shaking terror fit. Esau is stripped of everything that matters for an older son. He's lost his birthright. He's lost now his father's blessing because of his younger brother. He becomes enraged and breathing murderous threats against Jacob. He makes a plan, and it's a known plan. Esau was not so. As soon as daddy dies, I'm going to kill Jacob for this. Rebecca gets wind of the plan. Again, he doesn't hide it. And so she sends Jacob away with her to go live with her uncle until Esau calms down. He's gone for at least 20 years. I don't think she intended that, but he was gone for 20 years. The family is divided. There's murderous rage on one hand, fear running away on the other hand, deceit, betrayal, and the family is left in shatters. The family is left shattered into tatters because of this focus that they had on each one as self, their plans, their favorite sons, their gain, their fears, their worry. And this isn't new. And it hasn't changed in the last 4,000 years. When we focus on self, when we leave out of our, our equation and our planning and our feelings and our thinking, when we leave God out of those parts of our life, we end up hurting ourselves and hurting others. That self-centered worry I talk about eats away at us, tears up our digestion, causes stress, which causes so many medical problems. But it doesn't have to be, how do I deal with it? How do I make what should happen happen? How do I make a good result out of this horrible situation? When the alternative is, Lord, please take care of the situation. I trust you in it. Guide me into what I should do. For my family, for my neighbors, for my church, for my community, for my, my co-workers, for all the other people involved. It's counterintuitive, but when we are less focused on ourselves and more focused on others, we are more happy. The psychologists have proven that. And yet the temptation has always been, from the very beginning, to be self-inwardly focused. What did the devil tell Adam and Eve? You can be like God. Make yourself like God. You gain wisdom. Instead of trust, they sought the betterment for themselves against God. Just like Isaac and Rebecca, just like Jacob, just like so many people still today. And so as we come to the close of the service, the invitation on him is too so sweet to trust in Jesus. I want to invite you, if you have been caught up in either an Isaac-like, I've got to make my plans, I've got to, I'm going to dictate and control how this is going to happen, and I know what's best. 
or maybe you even call it like a Rebecca. I, I, how is this going to work out like God said? How is it going to work out the best for my son Jacob? What's going to happen when this happens? And, and how do I make sure that bad thing doesn't happen? And, and you're worried, you're fretting, or you're planning, and you're scheming, or you're trying to be in charge, or you're trying to figure out how to save everybody. It's not. Take the focus off for yourself. Put it on the cross. Who's already won the only eternal battle that matters? The one against evil and the one against death. Maybe you need to come and pray for those people you're worrying about instead of just worrying. Maybe you need to come and ask God to help you let go of control because you like being in control too much. It's, it's driving your blood pressure up and your stress level high and you just need to it's cliche, it's, it's a weak saying, but maybe you do need to let go and let God. Let God be God and God be in charge. That one's kind of weak. How about this one from the song? Be still and know that I am God. But He's got it. He can guide you through it. He can guide them through what they're going through. And let us turn our eyes not inwardly, but outwardly on how we can be His hands, His feet, and be a blessing. And we'll have much more peace compared to this family. And much more peace compared to our lives before. Whether you want to come pray, whether you want to come and find out how you can have that peaceful first relation, not first relation, but begin that relationship with Jesus you let him be in charge and ask him to forgive you like I prayed about earlier. Or you want to join this church. Please come while everyone else sings. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. 10-411.